from Mark's Gospel again, the second chapter, verses 13b through 17. Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered round him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the scribes and Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to go back to the opening hymn this morning and read a little bit to you again. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you and me? Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me? Jesus speaking to us. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? We have some stories of call this morning. Last week, if you remember, we were in Mark's Gospel, and I didn't pick the reading this week. And as I said, I was a psychiatric chaplain at St. Elizabeth's Hospital for four years in the past, working with deaf patients. The passage from the lectionary today was that passage that said, if your right hand offends you, cut it off, and if your feet take you in the wrong direction, cut them off. Those were the only passages that we literally cut from the scripture. We cut from the Bible because people would read that. And in their desire to serve God with the brokenness of their minds and their spirits, they would literally do those things to themselves. So we're going to follow up with a different sort of set of passages this morning on what it is to be called. Now, if you remember last week, Jesus said to the disciples, who do they say that I am? They said, maybe John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets. Jesus says to Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter got it right and said, you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, I have to then die and be raised. And Peter says, we don't want to hear that. And Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself and do what? You remember? Pick up your, pick up your cross and follow. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what it means to pick up your cross and follow this morning, looking at these two stories of call. Talk about should your life attract or scare no one was scarier than the guy in the first lesson we read this morning, the lesson that Neil read from Acts. Remember, it started out for several days. He was with the disciples in Damascus. Who was that he? Did you figure that out from the context? Saul. Who would later become Paul the Apostle? Remember his story? We read it at Bible school this year, and we told it, and we got to see a little video of our toilet paper theater characters. Saul is on the road to Damascus, and a light flashes, and he hears a voice saying, Saul, why do you persecute me? The same me is in the, uh, the song that we just sang, we come and follow me, the voice of Jesus. And he said, who is this? And he says, this is Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? Saul's blinded. He goes on to Damascus, and God appears to a man named Ananias and says, I need you to go because Saul is my chosen instrument. I need you to go and heal him and restore his sight. And Ananias rightly says, um, Lord, you know what he's doing to us, don't you? He's the one who has the letter from the synagogue from the temple authorities in Jerusalem saying that he has the right to arrest us and take us back where they would be stoned to death. And he said, he's my chosen instrument. And I think in one of the most profound moments of scripture for me, Ananias says to him, brother Saul, and restores his vision because he trusts God more than he fears Saul, more than he feels his own death at that point, actually. And so Saul is restored, and if you think that's the happy ending of the story, we read what happens next. They try to kill him because they don't believe for a second that this guy could possibly be anyone but to be feared, an enemy of the people, someone that was going to have them arrested and killed, and they plot to kill him, and he escapes. And it takes the testimony of another Christian on his behalf to say no. He has seen the Lord, and the Lord is going to use him, and the Lord uses him powerfully. And we didn't read the happy story of the fishermen. Everybody loves that, right? I will make you fishers of men. It goes through everybody's head whenever we talk about the call of Peter and James and John. 
And I read someone's doctoral dissertation years ago, and I unfortunately can't remember the name of the person, but who wrote this interesting, wonderful article about what it would have been like for the fishermen after their call. And what is it about fishermen? They're poor. They're sort of a rung in society above shepherds, people who work with animals. Your garden variety Pharisee, Sadducee, or scribe would look down on them because they were poor and uneducated, and they worked with their hands, and they worked all night, and they smelled like fish. They weren't great company. And we know that Peter, when he is called originally, falls down in front of Jesus and says, Get away from me, Lord. I am not worthy. And Jesus has a way of fixing that, doesn't he? Because Jesus doesn't always call the well-equipped, but he equips those to whom he calls. And the disciples go forward, but then what does Jesus do? But he looks, and there is a tax collector. A tax collector. Now, the fishermen in particular would have been impacted by him because as they passed with their fish every day, or even without their fish, they would be stopped, and he would take the little bit of money that they had. You know, this was a guy they did not like a whole lot. And they're thinking, well, there's something about this man, this man whose voice and whose eyes or whatever it was about him were so compelling that all he does is say, follow me, and they leave their boats behind. They leave their lives behind, and they follow him. And we know that they start to think a little bit more highly of themselves than they ought to because Jesus is always saying to them, the first of you will be the last, and the last will be the first. And even James and John get their mother to go to him and say, now, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, please let one of my boys sit on your right and one of them sit on your left. And they argue as they go along the road who's the greatest among them. We know that they buy into the hype a little bit. But then he calls a tax collector. Now, you've all done group projects in school, right? Or you've been on a committee in church or somewhere else. And you might be all excited that you've been asked to serve, and then you get in there, and there she is, that woman who has plucked your last nerve for as long as you can remember. The one who takes credit for everything everybody else on the committee does the one who doesn't do any work, the one who never answers a phone call, the one who you just don't like very much, right? If you have said no, I've never had that experience, you're either fibbing or you're just a better person than I am because I'm telling you the truth. Even among my clergy colleagues, I'll go to a meeting and I'll think, oh, yes, 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 here we go. Put the smile on your face. Sometimes these masks are helpful, aren't they? You sit there and stick your tongue out and nobody will know. But here is this tax collector. Sinful under the law because he handles Roman money. Roman money has the picture of the emperor and the inscription, the son of God. You've already broken two commandments right there, plus the graven image. This is why when you go to the temple, it's like going into another nation. You have to exchange the money because you cannot take this money because you can't spend it in the temple. And if the tax collectors were going to be looked down on any way, they generally were great at embezzling more than they were supposed to take from people. And this is who Jesus calls? Now we understand those who are looking at him saying, why does your master eat with sinners and tax collectors? And they're probably thinking, we wonder the same thing. But Jesus says, it's not the sick who need a doctor. It's the sick who need a doctor. It's not the people who are well. And those awful words, I have called not to call the right, I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners. As someone called by God, I can relate to that very well. Should your life attractors scare? No one's scarier than Saul of Tarsus. But there's a man who's very much like Saul of Tarsus in Liberia. His name is Joshua Lai. Some of you may know him by what he, his nom de guerre, as they call it, his fight name. When he was a warlord in Africa, he was called General Butt Naked. Yes, I said that from the pulpit, General Butt Naked. You know why they called him that? Because when he went into battle, he went in naked other than his sneakers. And he would carry a machete or a machine gun. He and one group of soldiers were responsible for the deaths of more than 20,000 Liberians during both their civil wars. He was a warlord, and he was a practitioner of a different faith tradition, and he thought being naked gave him special power, sort of like, you know, the guy with the long hair in the Old Testament, Samson, that he thought the power came from his hair. It was the Nazarite vow his mother had made when he was born. But he thought that this gave him a special power, and before he went into battle, he participated in the sacrifice and cannibalization of children, literally did that. 
And as he is going to battle one day, he saw a flash of light and he heard a voice, very much like Saul of Tarsus. And he said, who is talking to me? And the voice said, this is Jesus the Christ. And he put down his weapon and he walked off the battlefield and he never again took up arms. Not only did he do that, but his life now is devoted to the restoration of young men who had been taken as children and conscripted into war. And while there currently is no justice for him because there's no war tribunal in Liberia, he is willing to go through whatever happens if he is arrested because he is one who advocates for justice to be done for people like him who had murdered so many people. Now, when he walked off the battlefield and went into Ghana at first and then back to Liberia, do you think a lot of people believed his conversion story? No, I don't think so. Then there's a woman named Annie Lobear, who is the head of an organization called Hookers for Jesus. So we got General Butt Naked and Hookers this morning. You can go home and say, we had a wild time in church today. Hookers for Jesus. Their logo is a fish hook that said, Follow me and I'll teach you how to hook people. But she calls her organization Hookers for Jesus because she was a sex traffic worker for many years until she had an experience of Jesus Christ telling her to follow. And she left that life behind. But very much like Joshua Lahi, Lahi, she went back to the same place she had been so that she could minister to others in Christ's name to try to get women out of sex trafficking, to try to get them to wholeness and redemption. But if you look up her picture online, she's got pink hair and purple hair, and she wears a lot of makeup and a lot of nail polish and a lot of crazy clothes. And you might think this is not someone you'd want to be around, but this is a woman who has done powerful things for Jesus Christ because she allowed him when he called her speak to her heart, and she answered with all that she had and all that she was. Now, Jesus said, I didn't come to call righteous people. People who are well don't need a doctor, but those who are sick, they need me. But the trouble is that when people come into the church from a past that's either like general butt naked or the hookers for Jesus, we tend to look at them and size them up and judge them. I can't tell you how many times since I've been in the ministry I lost count after probably six or eight times that I would be invited to someone's 50th anniversary party. Some of you have had 50th anniversary parties, haven't you? Times of great celebration. And someone in the church would come up to me as I'm on my way and say, well, you know they had to get married, don't you? Seriously. I said to someone, well, I guess it took if we're at 50 years. Followed by shame on you. Shame on you for needing me to know that, because I didn't need to know that. Well, I thought you should hear about it. Why? So I could judge them. Which is why I have said, I've said it from this pulpit and every pulpit I've served, and I will continue to say it till I die, the best church service I've ever gone to is called a 12-step meeting. Because when you go into AA or NA or even OA, Overeaters Anonymous, you're not judged. You're welcomed. People have their arms open and say, come to us because we get it. We understand because I was there too. I know what it was like. And you know what happens if you backslide there? If you backslide in the church, God help you. You're going to be pointed at and talked about and whispered about and gossiped about. But if you backslide at a 12-step meeting, they say, we're going to give you a new chip for today and you get to start over because that's what we're about healing and wholeness. So, Jesus is going to call you. He's called you already because you're here. He calls us into the great fellowship of the church, and then he calls us to specific work within the church. We can either say, I am not worthy, because we're not, let's be honest. Or we can say, here I am, Lord, send me. Do what you will in my life. Clean me up, dust me off, set me on the right road. And remember Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul the Apostle? He'll argue for the rest of his life, I'm really an apostle because apostles become the 12 and those who 
dealt with Jesus face to face, and he said, he called me and he talked to me on the road directly. I'm an apostle. But Paul also said, I am the chief of all sinners. He never hid who he had been. He talked about where he was when Christ found him and what Christ has done, and he gives God the glory. We can be like that. We can answer the call and say, I will follow him, follow him wherever he may go. You're about to hear that, and if you want to get up and dance, get up and dance, because Christ has called you, Christ has come to you, Christ has lifted you up from wherever you were and set you on a new road. And if you're not willing to share that with someone else, then the body of Christ will get smaller and smaller and smaller, because if somebody comes to you and says, I was a mess until Jesus Christ came into my life, you will make more of an impact than if you say, are you saved? Do you know where you're going when you die? Or any of those platitudes that we say to people to try to get them to believe. I hope you will follow when he calls. Now, I'm not saying that because this is the charge conference season of the year when we're going to call you up and say, we got a job for you to do in the church. It's not about that. But it's about letting Christ into your heart and then letting him back out. It's about sharing what he has done for you so that you may lead someone else to wholeness and newness of life in his name. Now, when I was called, I've told you the things I heard. Oh, honey, you're wrong. God didn't call you to be a pastor. God called you to marry a pastor. Let me tell you, for daggone sure, that was not the truth. God doesn't call women. Satan calls women to confound God's purposes. You are a handmaiden of Satan, Terry. And I was so tempted to listen to those voices that told me what I wasn't able to do. But instead, thanks be to God, I listened to Jesus Christ and him alone. And that has made all the difference in my life. So listen for the call. Listen for your name. With all that you have within you and all that you are, say yes. Here I am, Lord, send me. To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.